ich heiße Denis. Äh, ich bin äh, 21 Jahre alt. Gut. Äh, was sind deine Hobbys? Äh, meine Hobbys sind äh, Fußball und äh, Musik. Äh. Još je nezaposleno Pa suši karta u jednom pravcu I kreće sad u tri Možda za uvek Aplicirala sam ovdje na više poslova Ali mislim da nemam dovoljnu praksu I nemam dovoljno znanje da bih mogla odmah da se zaposlim Pa sam se prijavila u Španiji Da završim master Zato što mislim da je kod njih malo drugačiji Da bih mogla malo više da naučim Nego što sam naučila ovdje Ljubavan je teši pa joj priča O večnoj ljubavi ona već sada sve zna, vreme daljina čine svoje, ljubav je žrtvova. Por katar vite, ne jemi na profili na koji te starve, por ne špese me da prma šum, se je on došta nje pun në Gjemani, për shemë dhe sepse kjo është qëllimi shkolle stonë. Zira e ekstelenteve për të qëarë për një të armë sa më të sigur diku tjetër. Dozvoljavaju ti da učiš, dozvoljavaju ti da napreduš u tvojoj struci i to je ono što stvari čovjek činite se sigurnim i činite da ne prestaneš da razmišljaš o tome da će se ikada vratiti ovdje i nastaviti svoj život. Ja sam bil v Nemački, sem rabotil dva meseci, ima mnogo razlika. Ovdje treba da rabotiš eden godina, a v Nemačka eden mesec da rabotiš poviše. Šta će dobiti, šta izgubiti, kako podneti strah, tišina odjekuje, šta ih očekuje, da li uspeh je krah. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first expert panel in the framework of our conference, Youth, Democracy, and Migration. The first panel is titled, Leaving the Region, Facts, Trends, and Challenges. I am Susanne Schutz, the Western Balkan Director of the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. This panel aims at looking deeper into motives and trends of immigration from the Western Balkans. In particular, our panelists will offer a detailed insight into push and pull factors, as well as possible differences within societies and among the countries of the region. We also intend to shed some light on data problems when it comes to migration from the region and discuss ideas on how to improve databases to better inform policy making. And of course, we will also look into uh, the debate of potential changes and trends resulting from the current COVID-19 pandemic. Before we go into uh, the actual discussions, I would first like to introduce our panelists and welcome and thank you very much for, for participating in this panel. Um, first, we have uh, Miran Lavric. He is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Maribor in Slovenia. He has worked in a number of research projects focusing on topics of youth, economic life, education and religion, mostly in relation to the region of Southeast Europe. He was the principal investigator in a large cross-national study entitled Youth Studies in Southeast Europe 2018 and 19. And he was also the head of a comprehensive national study of youth in Slovenia in 2010. Currently, he is coordinating a national study under the title Slovenian Youth 2020. Then we have Peter van der Auerert, and I hope I pronounced this correctly. Uh, he is currently the Western Balkans coordinator and IOM representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Before, in 2015 and 16, he coordinated IOM's response to the European and Western Balkans migration crisis, 
Apart from that, he has also gathered ample experience as senior advisor in peace processes and post-conflict situations, also in a number of countries outside of Europe. Welcome also to Danica Shantic, Associate Professor, Faculty of Geography at the University of Belgrade. She has focused in her research on migration and forced migration on, Balkan, on the Balkan migration route. She has been very active in making connections between policymakers, academia, and civil society organizations in Serbia and the Western Balkans. And she is one of the experts in creating an economic migration strategy of the Republic of Serbia for the period 2021-27. Then there is Bonjour Francine Pickup. Um, she has been the UNDP resident representative in Belgrade since May 2019. And she joined the UN system in 2002, has since worked with OCHA, UNSCO, FAO, and ILO in New York, as well as in country offices in Central Asia, Indonesia, and India, where she was UNDP country director. She has also worked with several development organizations, including Amnesty International, Oxfam, and the World Bank. As UNDP resident representative in Serbia, she has initiated a country office comprehensive intersectoral work on depopulation as a complex developmental issue that needs to be tackled in new ways using an integrated approach. And last but not least, we have Tomica Stojanovic, whom we already met yesterday evening in the discussion. He's a graduate from the University of Economics in Skopje. He has worked for the Peace Corps in North Macedonia, as well as until recently at the youth organization Mladi Info International. In September 2020, Tomica enrolled at the Democ Democracy and Human Rights Irma program at the University of Sarawi. So welcome again, and thank you for participating. Um, I think this will be a very interesting discussion. Before I will start with the questions to the panelists, uh, I would give the floor to Hans-Jörg Brey from the Southeast Europe uh, Society to give some technical advice. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all of you. Um, my name, as was said, is Hans-Jörg Brey. I'm the director of Southeast Europe Association. Uh, some, uh, I think, quite important operational remarks as to the options and procedures that you, mostly also as participants to this conference, uh, have. We are really striving uh, to have many of you, as many as possible of you, as active participants of this conference. And everyone is invited to comment and ask questions. Uh, there are uh, two functions th that you might use for that. Uh, first is the raise hand function. And uh, uh, you will be asked to comment, uh, to give a live comment. Uh, and uh, the second function, uh, then with this live comment, you have to unmute yourself. This is always very important. The second function is the Q&A uh, section where you can uh, write your written questions uh, to the panel. There's also uh, within the Zoom uh, function you have, you find the chat function. Please do not use this for asking questions. This is this function, this chat function is open to share ideas, uh, links, comments, and not for questions. And then uh, if you visit our quite interesting and multifunctional uh, website, you will find a virtual networking space. Um, I invite everyone to check it out. Um, it replicates a kind of bar table uh, reception, allows to virtually move around and mix and mingle. You can move through the virtual room and find people to talk to. Uh, just move close to the person you would like to talk to and a video connection will be established. So you are 
invited to try this out. Um, this, this space remains open throughout the conference and, uh, well, you are invited especially, of course, to spend your breaks there. Thank you. Uh, these were my remarks. I give back to the moderator, Ambassador Schütz. Yes, thank you, Antje Brei, for these uh, technical details. Um, we start with the questions to the panelists, and my first question goes to uh, Miran Labridge. Miran, you have authored a most comprehensive study on youth in Southeast Europe. And what are the main reasons, according to your study, why young people, especially in the Western Balkans, tend to leave the region? Are there any significant variations between the countries of the region? Uh, thank you for your question. It's a great honor to be in this really inspiring uh, event. Uh, I must congratulate um, the organizers for the really multifunctional and useful website with the library and everything. Uh, I really took the opportunity to go through it all and the cinema uh, and also learn something from uh, uh, this uh, walk of mine through, through uh, the website. So I would recommend it to everyone. But of course, I'm here to talk about the results of the studies uh, I uh, was in and uh, some of them uh, I was also uh, uh, leading. Um, the most important one is the one that you mentioned, Youth in Southeast Europe 2018-19. Uh, and from that uh, uh, study, it is very clear that the one big category uh, of uh, reasons uh, is uh, better living standard. That is why young people are leaving. This is their most common answer. Uh, but we should disintegrate, disintegrate this broad category, at least in two parts. I would say one is economic and really at the top of the list are uh, better salaries and uh, higher salaries and uh, better uh, employment opportunities. This is the economic part and this is the most important, the most common reasons, a reason uh, to go. But if you look at correlational analysis uh, and you ask yourself uh, what kind of young people are more likely to leave their country, uh, then you see that also there is a group of very dissatisfied young people with uh, the state of politics, especially with corruption. Uh, so this situation of connections over meritocracy, meritocratic rules is something that is really painful and it's a strong predictor uh, 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 predicting uh, immigration intentions of young people. Uh, so this second part, I would say, is that young people want to live in a decent society. Uh, one of the strongest predictors is actually satisfaction with the situation in the country as a whole, which includes uh, satisfaction with human rights, satisfaction with democracy, uh, attitudes in relation to to corruption, perception of corruption, and so forth. Also perception of the quality of educational system. For instance, there is a lot of, um, uh, uh, there is strong perception of corruption also in the educational system. So yes, functional institutions is something that young people want. And this is also one of the reasons why they are leaving their country. And within this second part, future of the country, perception of the future of the country is also a very important. Uh, uh, it's a very strong predictor. So young people who have more negative perceptions of the future, general future of their country, they're the ones who are much more likely to live. And actually uh, one of your interviewees uh, uh, said this very clearly in the videos on the website. Uh, he said that he noticed uh, in the countries where he went that they generally have a vision. There is a vision where society is going and this lack of vision that there is some good direction for my society is something uh, that is also inspiring, so to say, young people to live. So this is the core better living standard, and it is disintegrated into two parts. One is economic and the other one is this institutional corruption uh, part. And there is a third, uh, I would say, factor that I must stress very mm -hmm. strongly, and I call it closeness to the European Union, because uh, our study 
entailed 10 countries of Southeast Europe, and four of them are members of the European Union, six of them not, obviously. And uh, young people in countries who are members of so Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, and Slovenia have much lower immigration desires, and these immigration desires are in decline generally also. Uh, and this correlation is strong, even if you control it for everything that I was talking about. So the living standards, the perception of country situation, if you control it for human development index, GDP per capita, and so forth. So it is factor per se, the closeness to the European Union uh, in terms of uh, uh, political linkage, institutional linkage to the European Union, I would argue from these results of ours, is important factor uh, for deterring young people from emigrating from their countries, but even more importantly, uh, important factor for stimulating young people in the direction of return migration. Because young people from the four European uh, Union member states uh, have much more short-term migration plans. Majority of them, uh, majority of those who want to go abroad uh, in these four countries plan migration for up to five years. So majority plans to go out and come back within five years. Uh, while in Western Balkans, the opposite is the case. Uh, almost half of them plans to emigrate for 20 years or more. So you have a uh, very striking contrast here, uh, which means, and uh, I will close very soon, that Europeanization, as I call it, this is the process of Europeanization, stimulates return migration. Uh, it is good for return migration. The closer the country is to the European Union, the more economically developed it is, and the more uh, democracy is consolidated, the more you will have uh, return migration, circular migration. And circular migration, in turn, is good for Europeanization. And we basically know why, because young people bring back from abroad higher levels of human capital. This is good for economy. And they bring back also higher levels, I would say, of political capital, because our data quite clearly show, shows that those coming back from abroad are more politically and civically engaged and also knowledgeable uh, and they are good also for democratic development, democratic consolidation. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, these are the two leverages, I would say, that policymakers have. Uh, and I was really glad to listen to discussion uh, by European uh, representatives yesterday. Uh, they are working on Europeanization of the Western Balkans. Yes, this is one way to go. And the other way to go is stimulating return migration. Um, and yes, I will stop here. I'm sure I'm over yes, my sir. time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miran, for this uh, for sharing this very interesting and comprehensive uh, findings. Uh, and indeed, I have to say this: what you just said is, is one of the driving forces also for us to support EU integration of the entire Western Balkan countries. But now we go to our second speaker, now Peter uh, van der Alvareit. I saw you were nodding while Miran was speaking. So um, the question to you is: it is one of the major tasks, as defined by IOM to advance understanding of migration issues. As IOM's regional coordinator for the Western Balkans, how would you define the major challenges of migration from the region, especially looking at young people? Sure, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, I think I was, uh, I was nodding a lot uh, with the former speaker, who I think gave a very uh, comprehensive overview of something that I also notice uh, when I go out here uh, in the field uh, during, uh, during my work and, and speaking to, to young people. I just wanted to maybe first uh, highlight one point. I mean, I know that uh, it's a conference about youth, but uh, certainly in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which uh, is the place I know the best because I'm based here, what we're seeing over the last two or three years is also an increased phenomenon of people, let's say 30 to 45 to 50 years old with good jobs actually leaving Bosnia-Herzegovina. So in that sense, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's from what I understand here, it's a relatively new phenomenon. And these are literally people that have uh, that are packing up everything they have and they move to Germany, to Sweden, to uh, other countries uh, within the EU. And uh, usually they have good jobs. They have 
um, sometimes two incomes, they have a house, they have cars, they have a nice place to live, but they decide for the reasons that the previous speaker highlighted that for their younger children, they often have younger children, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina does not uh, give a future and they're often willing to take a step back economically speaking uh, in the country where they go to, to provide a better future uh, for, for their children. Um, in terms of uh, what I see as the, as the main challenges, I mean, I think one challenge remains is the, the lack of, uh, of uh, good uh, data inside the countries. Um, there is, a, I think youth migration is probably the one that has been mapped out the best, but the other, like older category of people, what I mentioned, not so clear. I also think that there is a tendency to focus on uh, migration of highly skilled um, people from the Western Balkans when it comes to analysis. Uh, actually, I think the reality is that also a lot of lower skilled people, people, um, to give an example, people that work in the cleaning industry, cleaning ladies, uh, waiters, uh, construction workers. Uh, also there, uh, we see um, a lot of movement away from specifically Bosnia-Herzegovina, but not only Bosnia-Herzegovina. These are often not catcher, captured in official statistics either, because there's a tendency for people to stay registered in Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example, to sometimes continue to claim uh, health uh, benefits or to claim unemployment benefits. So the whole category of people that are not highly skilled, uh, I think that is, an, and it's happening. Um, it's not reflected, for example, you have this contradiction where on the one hand you have very high unemployment figures, but then the reality of the labor market on the ground is entirely different. And we found, for example, when we were working on these migrant uh, accommodation centers and trying to find companies to do basic construction works, despite high levels of unemployment, you actually cannot find any company that can do the work because the workers are not there. So the, the whole issue of data remains, I think, something that needs to be uh, explored further. The, the third point I wanted to make uh, when you talk about challenges, um, my sense is that, um, you know, the, the, the Western Balkans, and, and I think, uh, again, I think it's not just Bosnia-Herzegovina, but maybe Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, has this uh, almost unsolvable dilemma in the sense that it seems to me that even when you look at uh, employment and low salaries, um, uh, the fact that in the private sector, people often don't uh, get their salary paid. Uh, employers who suddenly go bankrupt, the whole insecurity of uh, private jobs here, the fact that you have to pay for jobs, the fact that uh, you have to have a party membership uh, uh, card for jobs um, is also related to the other reasons why people are going. It always comes back down to the same thing. It's a lack of good governance and a lack of rule of law. What you're seeing in the labor market, the problems that people face are exactly the same problems that they face when they, or are caused by the same reasons for corruption in education, corruption in the health sector. So the point is that you need to move towards political renewal. Now, the problem is, how do you do that? Um, well, the only way to do that, short of some sort of <laughs> revolution, uh, is that you have people becoming politically engaged with an alternative view for the future. And I think it's been highlighted by a lot of people here. What is lacking here is a view for the future. People harp, the elites harp back to the past because it has served them very well since the dissolution of Yugoslavia to stay in power. But what is the vision of the future? Where does Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example, wants to be in 10 years time? If you, there is no, we are local elections here. Nobody is pushing or very few politicians are pushing for with a vision for the future. The problem is that you can only get political renewal, I think, if you have a lot of people that are highly, young people that are highly educated that are deciding to engage in politics. That's maybe not necessary in an established democracy like Germany. There you can have a small number of people that engages in politics while everyone else goes about their private life. In a situation like Bosnia, you need more people to engage in politics. And there is no alternative to this. It's great to have NGOs, it's great to do advocacy, and these are very important things. But at the end of the day, we need more people with alternative visions running for office. Now, the problem is that these people are leaving and young people are choosing. And um, I have uh, teenage kids myself. I would not advise them to go down that route. I would also say, if I would be from here, okay, go to Germany, you're highly educated, get a good job, build a nice life. But because of this migration phenomenon, you also reduce the chances for political renewal. 
there are young people that stay and there are young people that try to become politically active. But that's really for me the biggest, and I've been here now three, four years in the region, uh, it's the biggest conundrum. How, how can you move towards political renewal, which is an absolute condition because make no mistake, uh, we talk about improving the rule of law, improving governance, but we're talking to the very people at the top that are responsible for the lack of rule of law and governance. Um, so how, how is that going to change? The, the elites that have benefited the last 25 years from the system in place in Bosnia Herzegovina, for example, they seem to be quite unlikely to go to radically change. So how can we, uh, how can that be done while uh, a lot of the talented people are, are leaving? For me, that is, I think, really the, the, the biggest challenge uh, in the Western Balkans. And then a final point, and then I'll stop. And that is a discussion that is uh, absolutely politically, uh, I think uh, it's, it's impossible to have. There are gaps in the labor market in the Western Balkans. Uh, and I think uh, some of those gaps, if this outward migration continues, can only be filled by inward migration. Now, that is a topic, uh, if we look at, uh, that is a, a topic that politically, the, the discussion on that has not even started. If the population in the Western Balkans is getting older and more and more health workers and people that are working first line uh, support to elderly people uh, are leaving. If you have families because of migration that will no longer be able to take care physically of their elderly parents, as is still the case in the Western Balkans today, well then in 10 years time, the Western Balkans will face the same challenges that Germany and Belgium faces, meaning that you need personnel, that you need people to take care of the elderly. So that means inward migration. But that I think that discussion uh, is, is still very, very uh, difficult to have here. And I'll stop there. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for, for highlighting again also the mismatch of capacity or qualifications and, and jobs and for stressing the need for young people to engage in politics. And this is, I remember, what also um, Prime, uh, Vice Prime Minister Dimitrov uh, said yesterday. And I hope that this, con this uh, conference will also contribute to young people uh, getting, uh, well, encouraged to uh, be more active. Now we turn to Danica Shantic from uh, Belgrade. Danica, you were leading a government project considering intentions, attitudes, and drivers for migration in Serbia with special focus on young people. Could you give us an insight into your findings? Do they confirm with other research results? Like, for example, with the youth study presented by uh, Miran uh, Lavrić? Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and greetings from uh, Belgrade. Uh, I just want to thank organizing for having me here and I have this huge opportunity to, to be involved in this panel and to uh, say something about our uh, research and our results. Um, yes, we did, uh, we conducted our research uh, last year and um, speaking of um, uh, all things we, we heard yesterday and what our distinguished uh, panelists uh, said before uh, me, uh, I, I have one big conclusion uh, is that we have more similarities here in the Western Balkans than differences, even though some sometimes we are highlighting all uh, only the differences uh, we have here. So uh, considering uh, migration patterns and uh, talking about migration, we have uh, similar concerns, we have similar questions, and we have a similar field in which we have to be focused on in the uh, future. Um, uh, the, the, the previous speaker mentioned uh, the lack of data and that was the, 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 the initial uh, point of why we decided to go uh, to local communities in Serbia last year and to talk to people to see what do they have to say to us about migration and uh, about uh, all the topics that they are concerned of. And we wanted to know about their attitudes toward migration, about their intentions. Uh, we wanted to hear, to hear about how local communities uh, could be more involved in uh, migration management. And of course, we, uh, we, we uh, saw, we wanted to see how the migration is affecting the aging and how the old people, people uh, who have uh, their uh, children uh, and grandchildren in uh, some uh, foreign country, how they perceive uh, migration from this uh, 
point of uh, view. So this was a, a very uh, um, a big study and I will very briefly introduce you to some of the main results. Uh, the people in Serbia support uh, uh, their relatives, friends, uh, and their support, the, the vision of uh, uh, going somewhere if the life will be uh, better on some other place. And we started with this aspiration with the one quotation from the literature, uh, which match with our findings. Uh, people do not aspire to migrate. Um, they uh, aspire to something which migration might help them achieve. So uh, the people from Serbia achieve uh, uh, migration as a tool for a better life, for better uh, uh, living uh, conditions. And uh, that's why they're very supportive when we uh, talk about migration. Uh, since the lack of data, we have a feeling that more and more people are leaving Serbia, especially young people in uh, uh, recent years. And our uh, respondents in the field, uh, in the local communities, they uh, uh, said the same thing, that they think that more and more uh, young people leaving and we got one very interesting answer that uh, more families are leaving uh, Serbia. 20% of our respondents claim that families are uh, those uh, uh, who are uh, prepared and who already uh, left their local uh, communities. We, we uh, choose uh, different local communities with different development trajectories uh, because we want to see all part of Serbia and the, 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 the impression of, of migration. And at the end, we realize that, that we have very similar, if not the same answers. Uh, so, um, the, the, we also wanted uh, to know, uh, of course, um, uh, what is the perspective of Serbian people uh, considering uh, migration development nexus. And in Serbia, people usually perceive migration as a threat to development. Uh, first of all, from the demography reason. And usually people say, look around, look around people, uh, villages are empty, there is no people, uh, the, the people that we don't have any more uh, workforce, we don't have uh, uh, families to have young children, we are uh, older, uh, more and more uh, uh, older older and that's why the migration is perceived as a, as a threat. Um, if we speak about migration potential or emigration potential from Serbia, some 26% of our respondents, of all respondents, are ready to leave within one year. But if we just focus on the young people aged 20 to 24, uh, our respondents, uh, more than half, 51%, are ready to leave and from uh, 25 to 29, around 55% uh, are ready to leave within a year. So this is very live immigration potential. And this is something that we should uh, uh, talk about and consider. And the, the, the policy makers uh, should uh, uh, also have that in mind because it is very high immigration potential. Uh, so um, wh when we ask them, where would you like to go? The, the, the foreign countries are uh, at the top of, of uh, the answers with the 45 percent and uh, we, we were very surprised because the capital city of Serbia was always uh, the, 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 the place where uh, the migrants wanted to go from all other parts of Serbia but this survey show us that only 9% of our respondents would like to go to Belgrade. When we ask why would you go to, uh, why would you go abroad and not stay in a country, even in a, a more developed city or town, uh, they told us that uh, everything will be the same and they, they want a, a crucial change in, uh, in their lives. Okay, so, uh, you have to come to the close because I, I see our, our time is running really fast. Okay, so the main drivers, we already heard that, that it, it is the dissatisfaction of, of uh, uh, first of all, economic life, but they say that uh, they will stay if there will be improvement in economic life, in the conditions of uh, environment in Serbia, and young people said that uh, better uh, education is one of the factors that they could 
could uh, affect them to stay in, in Serbia. So uh, just briefly, uh, just briefly, our recommendations were also were toward those uh, major uh, uh, concerns, data, lack of data, uh, skill mismatch, reg regional inequalities, uh, improvement of youth employability and promoting of return and circular migration uh, of young people. Okay. Sorry for taking too Thank much you. time. Thank you very much. Now, of course, uh, very interesting findings and, and, uh, and of course, clear-cut recommendations. Francine, as resident representative in, in uh, Belgrade, uh, UNDP in Serbia is calling for a new approach to measuring, tackling and redefining depopulation in the country and in the region. Could you give us an idea about this integrated approach and what about the reliability of data and migration and mobility and how can we obtain or create better data? We cannot hear you. You have to, I don't know what's wrong, but now, now we should, no? We still cannot hear you, unfortunately. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. I hope the sound is okay. Um, so, yes, in UNDP, we, we were actually asked by, by the government to focus on depopulation because it was seen as such an important issue. And um, I have to say, when I arrived here uh, about a year and a half ago, I was shocked uh, how big an issue it was, how it was so pervasive and impacting on all aspects of life, really. So as an office, we've really focused in the last year and a half, and a half invested in understanding and tackling the issue. When we say we focus on depopulation, I have to say that is met with a lot of skepticism and resistance, particularly initially. People were saying it's impossible, it's too big an issue or it's inevitable, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and let's you know, just wait until the economic situation is fixed or the governance political situation is fixed and then slowly people will come back and, and that's how you deal with it. But we see it slightly differently. I think we, I know crisis is a bit of a strong word but it is in fact a crisis. Uh, we just launched a report with our colleagues in UNFPA uh, which predicts that in the next 30 years, the population in Serbia will fall by 30%. Uh, so by 2050, the population is expected to fall by almost 30%. And as was, was said before by, that, by Danica, this is in fact a development issue. It's not just a demographic issue, it's a development issue. Shrinking workforce, shrinking tax base, aging population and um, devastation of rural areas. So it's, a, it's an important development issue that we need to tackle head on. And then if we look at COVID, no one's actually mentioned COVID yet, but uh, COVID also um, is linked to depopulation. And, and I think that depopulation in some ways exacerbates the impact of COVID. So, we, uh, as the UN came out with a socioeconomic impact assessment of COVID, and we found that uh, communities' capacities to respond to the COVID crisis was undermined because of depopulation. We also see that remittances have gone down. They're estimated to have gone by, down by 27% so far this year. Um, and that's you know, approximately 1.5% one, one of, of, of GDP. We, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen to international migration, to mortality, and to people's decisions about their fertility. But it's, it's likely to have a big impact um, um, on depopulation as well. But we're interested in the opportunities around this, not just the, the challenges. And we do see opportunities. So for example, we see that uh, people are actually returning from their destination countries. Uh, and there's a possibility to work from home from Serbia in the country, uh, for the countries that they, that they were abroad in. So that's one opportunity. We're also interested in, re in researching those returnees who came back to the region 
uh, from European and, and other countries. Uh, we saw uh, a strong expression of solidarity, I would say, amongst the diaspora to their countries of origin during COVID. They, they wanted to help and, and support their country and they reached out to do that. So these are some of the opportunities that we think we can, we can harness along with new investment in rural areas uh, that we're also seeing. So moving forward, we're interested in solutions. Um, we recognize that people's decisions to have children or, or to migrate are very complex. People have already said on the panel that it's an it's a economic decision. That's true. It's a political decision. People want the governance and political situation to be right in the country. But it's also very much a cultural decision, right? Uh, people's decision to leave is also related to the fact that um, you're perceived, perceived to be successful if you leave. And you're perceived to some extent to have failed if you come back, whatever your individual circumstances. So there is a, it, it's a very complex uh, decision making and situation. And there's no one solution that will fix it. Um, and frankly, waiting for the political and economic situation to improve is probably not sufficient. So we need to come up with an integrated approach that hits multiple issues at the same time and starts creating new realities and a new narrative on the ground. The other thing to say is it's been seen as a, a battle over numbers. You know, how, how can we reverse the numbers? But actually it's, you know, the chances of reversing the, the numbers is, is, is very small. And we need to really look at um, instead, how to plan around this new demographic reality, how to live with a smaller population and proactively tap into the human potential that exists inside and outside the country and develop more adaptive policies uh, that can help people to live well here and to connect if, uh, if they're outside. So it's important to build on human capital, focus on what's in the heads, not just the number of heads, and, and focus on policy, policies that make people want to stay, connect, and, and come back. And then I would say that a regional approach is, mm -hmm. is really important. The issues are, 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 common, are common across the region, and it's, it's good that, in the e, that the EU is now addressing this issue uh, seriously, that we have a vice president uh, in the European Council who's focused on demography, that Germany has made this a focus uh, for their presidency. So it's really a, a good time for us to, um, to, to make change on this issue. If I'm, if, do you want me to answer the issue of data or? Well, actually, actually uh, yes, uh, we're running out of time. So maybe I would, I would like to put this, uh, to the um, to later and and uh, now let to uh, turn to Tom Itza. but thank you Francine also for bringing up again the COVID-19 aspect which of course uh, has changed the the landscape quite a bit but Tom Itza, um you were in a panel already yesterday you are a young person who has grown up in the region and uh, you are living in the region at least for the time being and uh, we already saw that you're also very engaged as an activist in youth issues, democracy, democracy and, and human rights. And how do you perceive the challenge of leaving your country and the region for your generation? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And just want to say, first of all, good morning from Sarajevo. It's such an honor and pleasure being, being part of this panel, especially after yesterday. Um, so as you, uh, as you said, uh, this is not my first panel where migration from the Western Balkans is discussed. I have actually participated and organized uh, various debates and conferences in, in various Macedonian cities. And I had a chance to talk with the different people who wanted to leave or wanted to stay and exchange the views with them and discuss uh, a lot of uh, ideas related to the, to the issue with more than 200 young people. And let me just uh, use this opportunity to, to speak in this panel and share with what I've learned uh, from these discussions. Young people living in the Western Balkans is a very tough reality of the region. In my conversations with those who left, 
or were planning to leave the region during the past several years, the most dominant sentiment, as we saw from all of the discussions so far, was not having the opportunity to build a well-paid and successful career. Something that the EU countries or just like any Western countries can actually offer them that. I was told that most of them who left, it was because they could not have just imagined a happy future for them in the region. As uh, most of the research shows, uh, the main reason is definitely the economic one or the inability to find a well-paid job or a job that they would like to develop their further career in. And yeah, so unfortunately, that's, that's the main, main reason why they would like to leave the, the Western Balkans. Um, while good jobs uh, were the most repeating issue in most of the conversations that I had with young people, discussions were, uh, were most lively and most emotional when we also discussed the, the quality of life. Um, unfortunately, many of them spoke about the lack of a good health system, fear of air pollution, and also poor education quality. Many also spoke about the lack of basic human rights in our region, for some religious freedoms and for others, those were the sexual discrimination. The rule of law and corruption were also a point of frustration for them. Um, the second most prominent sentiment in my discussion next to the disappointment why they wanted to leave was the sense of hope. It was that hope that they would, by leaving the Western Balkans, they will uh, find uh, a decent job, a good health care, and distribution of resources in future would depend on that in the EU countries or any other Western country. And right now, it, we're living also in a very, very difficult period when we're fighting the, the COVID pandemic. And uh, as Francine mentioned, uh, the trends of living will actually continue or even accelerate. And uh, to slow down and, and hope to reverse those trends, we need definitely are in need for new policies and investments that would open space for job creations throughout the regions and need those policies and investments to make the quality of life better. Um, as you said before, I had the part, I had the pleasure to be part of a, of a group uh, that was consisted of 11 young people from the region. And together we drafted a, a a policy where we concretely say what we want in the region to be changed, from cleaning our rivers and settling the ground for a high level of democratization to improving our education and also mobility. Our ideas, as I said, are concrete, but we also hope that they will bring up the hope in the region. And in the end, we also have to be honest. The Western Balkans mm -hmm. are not the first nor the last European region faced with the challenge. Uh, we've seen European regions who also fa face the challenge of brain drain, including in a very recent uh, history, Greece, who is managing to improve the situation and make that brain drain to brain circulation and bring their people back. So I feel that our region should also be among them. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tomitsa, and thank you also for sticking to the time frame. We now have lot less time for questions than actually planned, but I would like to um, give the floor to Hans-Jörg Bray because he has gathered some questions from, from the audience. Thank you, Ambassador Schütz. Uh, up to now, there are quite a few questions and uh, uh, let me start uh, with inviting our audience to pose questions and do this please in the FNA or uh, question and answer uh, section, not into the chat uh, section. Uh, anyway, I have gathered some questions from the chat uh, section. In the chat section, just a section, uh, just to remind you, it's a good place uh, to share links to studies on the, on the subjects that we discuss here. And this is also, uh, these are things that uh, you will find and available uh, in the chat function. So if you wanna step into the discussion, uh, either use the uh, Q&A um, section or function or raise your hand. Well, we have uh, some questions uh, up to now and uh, uh, I collected them. Um, first of all, there's one question. This was uh, more or less directed to Professor uh, Zantic, who uh, was uh, 
referring to the fact of uh, corruption and uh, the lack of rule of law um, as a reason for emigrating from the Western Balkans and from, from Serbia. And there is one remark to that, uh, saying that uh, most probably uh, these facts should be uh, on the first place uh, as reason for uh, emigrating uh, from, the, from the region. Um, there's another question which is quite broad. I'm, I'm not sure whether we can address it here, whether it's the right place. Uh, it goes like that. What are EU countries do to fight corruption in the Western Balkans? Um, I probably might add what do the Western Balkan countries do to fight corruption within their uh, countries? Okay. Um, and then uh, another question is about reliable data. It's uh, actually very concretely addressed to circular migration. The question is, are there reliable data on circular migration? Referring to EU countries like Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Croatia, this is a, uh, quite a special uh, question. Um, as I don't see more questions here, I just check uh, again whether something has uh, come in, no. I, I would like uh, to add one question. I've, I found it uh, very interesting, um, Mrs. Pickups uh, talking about um, the projections for the Serbian population falling for 30% within the next 30 years, and also referring to the devastation of rural areas in this respect. I, I would be eager to hear some more about this aspect of internal emigration, internal population movements within the countries. That's for, the, these are the questions for this round. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for giving some of the questions. I think uh, we have time for one last round, uh, but I would ask the, the panelists to, to be brief uh, and try to, to answer the questions, but also maybe comment on, on uh, your co-panelists' um, um, analyses. I think the issue of corruption as, as a main reason for, or as a main driving force, the issue of, um, of data and, of course, available data on circular migration and on uh, 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 migration, internal migration inside the Western Balkans, inside the countries. I think these are uh, very uh, interesting issues and uh, I would welcome if you could uh, uh, mention this. Maybe we, we take the, the, the same um, direction. We start again with, uh, with Miran Lavric from Maribor and uh, from sort of the outside of the region. Would you like to start on answering or commenting the questions? Yes, of course. Um, maybe I can take two questions partially uh, on the data uh, about um, uh, circular migration. I'm not aware that there would be any um, good statistics uh, in uh, Western Balkans for the countries of Western Balkans. Uh, for uh, the EU member countries, you have data of numbers uh, immigrating to uh, each country, but you don't know whether these are returnees or just other people in, uh, uh, moving in. Um, I kind of solved these issues by, uh, this issue by concentrating on citizens of, for example, Slovenia. And I was looking at numbers of citizens of Slovenia uh, coming back to Slovenia, and I could then deduce uh, what is this return flow. But maybe Francine will know more about this issue, I'm sure. Uh, this is to my knowledge. And about corruption, uh, well, I'm not ob obviously a politician or expert on what is EU doing in terms of uh, uh, dealing with corruption in Western Balkans, also local governments. I mean, we all know basic uh, elements uh, here, but I would uh, 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 focus here on the idea that uh, also Hans-Jörg brought uh, 
uh, about um, that uh, it should be solved uh, from within or also from within. Also, Peter talked about the uh, uh, importance of political engagement of young people, civic engagement, political engagement, taking functions and, and uh, through this mechanism, fight corruption. Uh, the problem here is, I think, uh, that uh, the best potentials are leaving the country. So the ones who are most critical about the situation of home, they are the ones who are leaving the country. And this brings me to the question of political will uh, when we're speaking about uh, stimulating return migration. Because returnees, as I said before, are uh, critical citizens. You know, they are... Uh, 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 maybe not that very uh, welcomed necessarily by competitive authoritarian regimes in the Western Balkans, as they are called by political science. So we should ask, is it really in the best interest of these regimes to import critical uh, citizens? Uh, and I think that it is really important that uh, these uh, endeavors to, to, to attract uh, re-migrants are uh, somehow uh, stimulated also by the European Union and that they are conducted also at the regional level so that we have some stronger incentives and mo more power on this uh, uh, issue of stimulating return migration. Uh, and return migration uh, will, I think, work uh, for the benefit of uh, higher political engagement of young people and not that very young people and also help fight corruption and other issues. So these were my two main points and I'll leave the floor to others. Well, thank you very much. And before giving the floor to, to Peter, I would like to comment on the, on the issue, what does the EU do to fight corruption? And indeed, I, I agree with uh, Miran and also Votanti. It's mainly, of course, the task for the countries themselves to fight corruption, but what the EU does, uh, the EU supports uh, and gives advice on, on how to create structures to fight corruption, how to create the right kind of legislation. So these are, this is where, where the EU supports, but of course the countries themselves have to do the work. And I know, we know that this indeed is not easy, but this is why we keep pushing. But now, uh, Peter, for, for you, um, the COVID-19 pandemic was mentioned already and um, the measures that uh, governments uh, are taking and uh, uh, maybe you have some, some insights also on, on how this um, pandemic is, is changing, exacerbating possibly um, the, uh, the migration crisis or, or also preventing migration. Pre uh, um, and uh, we heard also from Francine that the, um, the, the remittances have decreased considerably. So this will again also um, influence the economic situation. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think, uh, first of all, um, I think we already have seen a significant negative economic impact uh, when it comes to COVID related to uh, diaspora of the Western Balkans. Uh, it's not just about remittances, it's also about the fact that, I mean, put it very concretely, the diaspora did not come back over the summer um, for what they usually do for their holidays, or at least they came back in much smaller numbers. And uh, you can see that here, for example, in Sarajevo, there's a lot of businesses that are affected by that from beauty parlor saloons to uh, fashion shops, to restaurants, to bars, to cafes. So we already have this negative imp economic impact here, both in terms of remittances and in the fact that the diaspora did not come back in their usual numbers. Um, and it's remarkable how many different services diaspora uses when they are back in their country of origin, including for example, car maintenance, um, fixing things uh, related to furniture that they have. So there's a wide broad for the time being. I don't think that we have data on it, but it is very clear that we already have a severe economic impact on the second point. Of course, the health systems are struggling with the COVID response in the Western Balkans because already before COVID, so many doctors and nurses were uh, gone and they were already struggling to take care of the population in normal times. It's not just about the numbers, it's again also about corruption, about mismanagement. We had the whole scandal of the famous raspberry respirators here 
uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina, where you know the elite could not stop themselves from stealing, even when COVID was at its high. So, um, so definitely that we have seen the impact. What the longer term impact? Uh, and the third part I wanted to say, sorry, we already have seen a decrease in what I would call more formal, uh, informal immigration out of the Western Balkans for seasonal work, and specifically when it comes to the Croatian coast. Uh, Bosnia to governor, we have a lot of people, waiters, cooks, cleaners that informally, they're not always going there officially because there's, a, of course, a big gray economy at the coast there. They didn't go this summer uh, because simply there were not enough guests in Croatia. So we already see that, you know, some of the outer migration is slowing down. Maybe not the formal one, maybe not the one that one the people that apply for a permit to go to Germany, but definitely this type of more informal work has already had negative economic impact. Final point. Clear, if remittances keep going down, then the Western Balkans economies will face a double whammy. On the one hand, the local economies are shrinking. On the other hand, the outside revenue that is arriving is also shrinking. So you can certainly uh, see that there might, that there will be, I think, an increase of, uh, of poverty, especially because social welfare systems are, are not particularly, um, or at least not strong enough to, to absorb the shocks, uh, that, the shocks that are here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, Danica, how uh, f uh, would you like to answer the, the uh, questions and, and uh, comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, we, we, we come to the point, uh, and I, I will be a little bit back. Uh, we'll, I would go a little bit back to the yesterday conversation. Uh, we have one sentence from the Mr. Verkel. He said we have to work on all fronts. So this, uh, our questions today related to, uh, to us from our audience is just exactly what uh, we have to do. Uh, well, data is the maybe number one question uh, on the Western Balkan and uh, of course in Serbia. And you mentioned the economic uh, uh, strategy, migration strategy in Serbia. Uh, 2021-2027, and the first measure, the first action is related to uh, strengthening institutional capacity for more uh, quality migration data. So uh, I guess that it will be very huge step forward in uh, resolving this issue. Uh, speaking of corruption, this was uh, the direct question. Uh, if you see all uh, surveys, all studies, or is all research in a recent period uh, connecting with all uh, Bal West Balkan countries, uh, you can notice that the economic factor is among the most important. Of course, we always mention, and our respondents mentioned also corruption and also the lack of uh, the the. Uh, stay uh, lack of uh, political uh, appropriate political system but when we ask our uh, respondents why do they uh, always highlight uh, the economy situation they said that if they cannot change the system they can change their lives and their lives and the best thing is to to take their lives in their own hand and go abroad and try to to make uh, uh, for decent living so um that, that is the, the, the most uh, simplest answer that we could uh, get from our respondents. And uh, the finally, I, I will not take uh, uh, much time. Uh, I think that uh, the good migration governance is something that we should more uh, talk about. And uh, uh, we have one very common sentence in uh, uh, migration uh, theory is that migration is what we make of it. So let's make something good and let's make something prosperous and uh, it is also very good to connect with our diaspora, to talk with them, to uh, make some people uh, want voluntary to return to Serbia, to do something here, to, to open some uh, uh, firms, some uh, small entrepreneurship, and just to, to be the, the force for a, a good local uh, development in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Francine, uh, uh, this this issue of managing migration you already mentioned, and uh, how would you see, uh, how would you, how could you answer the the questions that that were posed? Thank you. Let me answer on um, the issues of data and data around internal migration and circular migration. So. I mean, in general, clearly data is a key, key issue here. 
And we know that the census and the administrative data that's available in terms of people crossing borders is, is inaccurate, is delayed, uh, isn't capturing the picture at all. Now, one of the avenues that we've gone down to really try to have a better understanding is to really explore big data. So for example, we've used LinkedIn data to understand the destination countries, the skills that are being lost and the sectors that are being impacted. So we know, for example, that it's genetic engineers, it's doctors, it's dentists, it's researchers, um, and they're going to Germany, they're going to the US and Scandinavian countries, Aust Austria. So uh, then we've also used Google Trends data to get a, basically to build a diaspora map to see where the diaspora are actually li living, which cities they're living in across Europe, for example. And this kind of data can help us, help the government develop programs to reach out to that diaspora, to attract them back for the skills that are missing in country, for example, or can help the government to uh, design education programs uh, to build the skills that are missing, or it can be used by local companies who aren't able to find the right skills, um, but also aren't reaching out to the diaspora to try and attract them back to fill the jobs that they're trying to recruit locally. So big data uh, is, a, is a big uh, opportunity. Uh, we launched with our colleagues in UNFPA a, a, a data challenge. And on the issue of internal data for uh, internal migration, for example, uh, we are working with the three mobile operators, so mobile phone data, uh, and with Biosense, which is a research and, and development institute here in Serbia, to better understand through mobile phone data, uh, internal migration movements. Now, I wanted to have a go at answering the question on data regarding circular migration. I think things like uh, Facebook, for example, social media data from Facebook could help uh, give us more information on circularity of, mig of migration. Um, but uh, one other area that I just wanted to flag is uh, we are doing more qualitative research. So we are looking at, for example, the people who are coming back, who are bucking the trend, uh, and they, they exist particularly in the tech sense, uh, sector, but beyond tech as well. And we talk to them about what are their pain points in coming back and what are their happy moments to better understand what are the challenges and opportunities to attract people back. And, and you know, we found some of the things that we're saying, environment matters, smoking in public places matters to people. These are some of the pain points. Having Cyrillic in, in the embassies only matters and so on access to healthcare. These are some of the pain points that need to be fixed if people come back. And then we also looked, uh, we did some analysis with uh, Digital Serbia on digital nomads. These are people, again, who are bucking the trend. They're choosing to come to Serbia, to Belgrade, because they think there's something good about it here. So we, we, we look at them, we understand what their motives are, and we see if we can learn from that experience how to make the environment better for other people, other IT professionals, other diaspora uh, who want to come back. Uh, if I may, just one final point. There was another question that came up, uh, which I think is a really good question. It's, is it just an overlapping confluence of different um, issues, governance, politics, and so on? Or is there a demographic crisis in, in, in particular? If I may, I, I do think that we should be talking about a demographic um, crisis or issue or challenge in particular, because it's not like in, in Germany here, in the sense that in Germany, you, you have a shrinking population, but it's due to people's decision to have fewer children. Here we've got that people are deciding to have fewer children, but they're also leaving. And it's that conflict, it's that combination of people leaving and smaller families that is creating such a difficult situation here. So we do think it's not enough just to address the governance issues, not enough just to, to address the economic issues. We can't wait. We really need to focus on the new demographic realities that are facing the Balkans and, and see how we can address these issues by planning uh, around this new demographic reality 
and building the human capital that exists inside and outside the country. Thank you. Well, thank you again, uh, Francine, and indeed, uh, it's a question of, of time as well, and, and that was uh, mentioned yesterday again also by uh, our uh, Minister of State, Roth, uh, who said we people don't want to wait uh, 10 years. It's a question that we all have to answer now, and thank you very much. Tom, um, Tomica, um, how do you see, uh, what are your answers to the questions? Um. I agree with what pretty much everyone said here today. And um, I also agree with Mr. Roth that we don't have time. We have to act right now in order to keep young people in the country. But also we have to think about that circular migration. And we also have to think about that one day the Western Balkans will be part of the European Union. Um, it might take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. We don't know the, the time frame but we strive to get there and I'm confident we will be there. Uh, so that said, um, we have to work on the countries from, the, from their core. Yeah, people are dissatisfied with the corruption, with the rule of law, with the failing policies, with the discrimination that's happening because we are still not there on the European Union level and we need to work. And why do we need to work? It's true, young people leave the country and not just young people, elderly people as well. But once we are a member of the European Union, we have to think how mobile the union is and how sometimes, even if your country is the best country in the world, you just don't want to live there just because you have a different preference. So we have to think how making our Western Balkan countries better in uh, all those areas that we just discussed will attract people of the European Union people from Ireland, from Germany, from uh, Netherlands, they should be able to come and live in our area. But in order to come and live there, they need to be sure that their criteria in the European Union will be satisfied in the Western Balkans as well. So as a message to the government, we have to work in order to make our countries better so we can attract the definitely our diaspora and our people who really love the country, but also other people who would love to live there, work there, or maybe even retire there because the Western Balkans are beautiful. We have beautiful scenery, seas, lakes, and I think it's just a, just a matter of time and we need to react fast in order to make them work for everyone. Thank you, Thomas, and I can only agree with you. The Western Balkan countries are, are beautiful and, and they are attractive, but indeed uh, one needs uh, people, foreigners, non, non people from, not out, from outside the region have to have the right uh, conditions to, to live there. And that, of course, is also true for, for foreign investors. We have time for um, another round of questions from the audience. And I would like to ask Hans-Jörg Brey again to, to uh, put in some questions. Well, indeed, uh, uh, a number of quite interesting questions uh, have popped up in the Q&A uh, session, and I try to put them in a, in, in a certain order. Um, there's one question uh, asking, does emigration cause an increase of nationalism and more inextricable political situation in the Western Balkans, countries? Um, there's another question, um, which is a criticism to the uh, politicians in the region, asking why do politicians from the region send their children to private schools or abroad? And why they use health services abroad and don't trust the services they manage themselves within their country? So this is a crit criticism on uh, the domestic uh, infrastructures. Then there's a question, are the governments in the Western Balkans really interested to stop emigration? Uh, there's a citation of some politicians uh, who are cited to having said, we don't have capacities to keep the academics in our own countries. And then the, there's a specific uh, issue addressed to Miran uh, Lavrich. Uh, uh, the speaker says, or the, 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 the person says, that uh, they appreciate your 
Miran's excellent point that returnees challenge the authoritarian regimes in the region. Um, and the question is, what does EU do to help to incentivize this, uh, this so much needed brain gain of people coming back? Um, and uh, a last questions, question, how could the EU uh, help the elites described as responsible for the corrupt system more accountable than it does until now? So far, the questions for this round. Well, thank you very much. These are indeed uh, very interesting, controversial questions. And uh, I think this will give uh, you uh, good, good basis for, for interesting answers. Nationalism or how does national growing potential national grow, um, growing nationalism uh, go together with uh, returnees challenging um, the countries? And of course, yes, indeed, politicians, they themselves send their children abroad. And I have seen that as well in the country I lived in. And so uh, what um, do governments, our governments actually interested to stop migration? So shall we go um, the same uh, round? Mira and you were actually um, asked uh, in person specifically. Uh, yes, we can go this way again. Um, maybe I will try to answer two questions first on the nationalism issue. Uh, our data show that there is quite a strong correlation between having experience of being abroad and being less nationalistic. So young people coming back home are less nationalistic. So uh, if we could deduce from that something very simple is uh, that uh, return migration would stimulate less uh, nationalism. But it also means that the ones staying at home might be more nationalistic or prone to some nationalist arguments. So uh, I don't have clear data on this, uh, but in general, my impression is, yes, that more liberal, cri critical, less nationalistic young people are leaving and this leaves more room in home country uh, for uh, the growth of nationalist ideas. Uh, maybe other speakers will say something uh, on this topic uh, too. And the other direct question uh, towards me, what can the EU do uh, with this challenge of uh, elites uh, uh, political elites not necessarily being very keen on circular migration. Uh, I think that uh, regional uh, programs, very transparent regional programs, initiatives, uh, who can be kind of inspired and coordinated uh, also by the European Union are needed. So if they are regional and if governments are binding and are somehow obligatory for the governments, if governments accept that they will proceed uh, in the very specifically designed way in terms of implementing programs, which, you know, we know the measures. There is a lot of measures out there that have been tried in small scale uh, in different countries. So we should go through these measures, make them uh, regional, make them obligatory for the governments, and uh, make them transparent, um, uh, open for evaluation. And I think that this would help really to stimulate return migration and help Europeanize these countries. So it is not easy, but uh, I think it is possible if there is political will, uh, especially in the part of the European Union. I think the European Union here is really important actor in terms of stimu stimulating at least uh, this kind of change. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I would uh, stay in the same order. So go go again to Peter uh, to to hear from you. Uh, how would you uh, answer these these uh, questions which were posed? How to uh, um, 
stop corruption, how to, where nationalism versus uh, returnee influence, Europeanization. I think these are all very, very important issues. And I would like to hear from, from you how you see this. Yes, and I, I think there are issues that we should probably, I, I'll be, how to say, I'll be more direct maybe or less uh, nuanced because we don't have much time. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it's the first time that I'm disagreeing here with uh, Miran on this. And I think this notion of return migration, um, I, I just don't see it happening, to be very honest. Yes, you can have it small scale. Yes, we can put some policies in place, you know, to encourage people to come. But frankly, unless you address the underlying issues, which I'm sorry to say, we can say, yes, we need to live with the new demographic reality. I agree with that. Of course, there's no point in pretending that tomorrow we're going to have triple the amount of doctors that we have today in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So we need to find policies for the realistic, for the situation that we have today. But frankly, it seems to me that the crisis is purely political. So unless you address, unless you have real political change on the ground, I think return migration is not going to happen. I just don't see it. Um, uh, yes, we can do little projects. And, and sometimes I feel that a lot of these projects that we're doing is because we're sort of not, the, the actual addressing the real issue is too complicated. So let's do some capacity building. Let's encourage some companies to say, okay, let's get a returnee to come. There's like one person who comes back, he or she is celebrated as an example. I don't want to be cynical about it, but uh, the, the, the problem remains for me uh, hardcore uh, political. So that, that is where we need to look at. How can we support political change? How can the diaspora, young people that are outside, how can they also be catalysts maybe for political change in their own country? For me, that is an important area to explore. Um, again, the, it's a nuanced discussion, of course, but for the sake of time, I just want to make two more points. First, do the Western Balkans countries want to stop uh, outward migration or not? Um, I think, first of all, I think it depends on the country. Uh, but if I can maybe speak from the country where I'm sitting, my sense is, is, is that this outward migration serves everyone quite well. And it serves quite well for reasons that were already identified. Critical people leave our side. It's a safety valve. Instead of people going to the street because the services are collapsing or corruption, they know that actually they don't need to go on the street. They can go to Europe. That's the first thing. So it's a political safety valve. And then secondly, it also allows um, remittances to support elderly people specifically, therefore, uh, this, the, the fact that the state can actually not take care of elderly people and gives them shameful pensions, for example, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, is hidden by remittances. So my sense is that the, the ruling elite uh, in this country has no interest of stopping outward migration, despite what, what the discussions may be. Very quick point, finally, on nationalism. I think that's a very complex issue. Um, for example, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, again, when you look at uh, it depends when people left. I agree with what uh, Miran said about young people leaving now. Definitely, yes. But it's slightly different with people that became refugees uh, during the war. And what we're seeing actually sometimes, and we've done quite a bit of work here on extreme nationalism and, and violent extremism. And what you see is actually that you have also very negative influences from diaspora coming here in the summer, uh, being extremely nationalistic creating issues amongst Bosniak Serbs, Croats during the summer, and then they go back to Sweden and lead their lives. So the, the, it's, a, it's, it's something that warrants a separate panel discussion, but the impact of uh, outward migration on nationalism inside here is, a, is an interesting one. And I think it's very complex. You cannot just say, oh, it's positive or negative. There, there's different layers there. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe if I answer, because there was uh, also uh, one one uh, issue mentioned, what does the EU actually do to stop uh, brain, uh, or what does the EU do to, to further brain gain? And uh, uh, I would like to mention that, uh, as was mentioned yesterday, of course, there are the, the uh, university programs, there is Erasmus+, Plus, uh, which... Um, helps people from the region to integrate also into the uh, university system and and gain in in brain and then also as far as diaspora is concerned yes there are also some programs uh, for, for uh, supported for example by the german government to uh, connect diaspora with the countries of their origin but i have to admit so far um, the uh, the uh, results um, the 
are limited, but, but there is the awareness, but I'm sure that this issue will, will come up also in, in later panels. So um, I will now continue giving the floor again uh, to, to Danica to, uh, say, uh, to answer the questions. And I say you need to de de unmute your, your... Sorry, sorry, I'm here now. I, I will just pick one question because of the time. And uh, it is a very interesting question. Uh, does government, governance, uh, governments uh, in Western Balkans are interested in stopping uh, immigration? Well, you cannot stop immigration and we all know uh, that. And uh, speaking of uh, that, we can just, uh, I, I just want to, to highlight once again, make a good governance and uh, of uh, migration processes in, in the countries. Uh, and uh, I will just uh, uh, mention once again that Erasmus Plus and the student mobility, uh, because one study in Croatia uh, conducted uh, last year, I think, showed that if students have uh, opportunity to go abroad and to spend some years, it is a uh, higher possibility to come back and to use their social capital in the country of origin. So we have to just make this uh, uh, more uh, visible here and uh, we have to uh, make our students uh, more opportunity to go abroad and to, uh, to be there, to spend some time there. Um, speaking of stopping immigration, it is also uh, very, uh, very important to say that, uh, as we mentioned, the rural areas in Serbia are uh, in very hard situation because of the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the outflows that last for decades. Uh, so when we speak about those returnees, uh, we just uh, wanted to see them in those areas uh, as uh, uh, drivers of, uh, of success, of uh, like um, an uh, engine of uh, progress uh, of, of those areas. So uh, we want their, uh, first of all, social capital. And then we can talk about, of course, uh, about remittances because Serbia has a, a large amount of money that the diaspora is sending to the country, but we don't see uh, those those uh, money in uh, economic sphere, those money is using for everyday needs. So uh, government uh, with the connection with the, our diaspora wants to change that and wants to make uh, those uh, remittances more in, in the country and more for the progress of, of econom economy. And uh, this is of course a huge question and I, I could talk a lot about uh, this, uh, what governments do and what governments didn't do and missed to do uh, in uh, previous uh, years. But I, I think that I will now give the floor to someone else. And if someone have a question, I can type it, uh, the answer instead of speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, Francine, uh, how do you see the situation and, and how do you answer the questions? Thank you. I want to answer two of the questions. So the first one around emigration leading to uh, greater nationalism. I'd like to flip that around and, and agree with some of what was said before, which is that encouraging people to come back um, and encouraging people from outside, I mentioned the digital nomads, to come here certainly adds to the diversity of views and can help pressure for change uh, because of their international experience, because of their different expectations from the government and so on. So I do think that um, diaspora returning uh, and attracting foreigners to the Western Balkans can really bring change um, and change the character of, of, of the society to, to some extent. Um, when it comes to the question about, you know, what, what the EU should do, our approach is that, you know, individual projects on diaspora or on infrastructure or whatever, or on governance or on e economy, individual siloed projects won't really address the issue. It's a very complex issue. We've seen today that it has many different strands to it. So we really need an integrated approach and we need a portfolio of solutions that hit on many things at the same time. To give you a very simple example, 
you mentioned investment in infrastructure, and I think that is critical. We need investment in infrastructure in some of the smaller towns uh, in, in Serbia. But why not do that investment in infrastructure in a way that supports the aging population and also supports young families who want to have children? So, you know, when you turn a certain age here, typically you fall off a cliff or you're perceived to fall off a cliff. You stop being productive. You stop contributing to society. Why don't we look for ways in which uh, people can grow old and continue to contribute? Uh, where, where actually, as uh, Tomica says, where, you know, the Western Balkans can be a nice place, an attractive place for people to come and grow old, rather like Florida or like the, the coast of Spain. There's no reason why that can't happen. Uh, and so why can't old people, uh, maybe some old elderly care homes combine with kindergartens? So young people are, young women are freed to work uh, and elderly people are looking after their children. In, 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 so these kinds of infrastructure projects that directly address depopulation issues uh, should be part of the solution. So the Western Balkans investment plan that the EU has just announced is a great opportunity for us to address these issues um, in an integrated way. And then just finally from my side, I mean, this is clearly a, a shared journey. No one organization, no one project will, will be able to you know, tackle this huge issue. And so we really need to work together uh, as the EU, as Germany, as uh, international organizations and uh, academics and so on to really see how we can come together to address this issue. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and thank you also for mentioning the, uh, the, the Commission's new investment plan, which is really important, which will give uh, at least 9, 9 billion uh, euros over the next seven years to the region. And indeed, we all have to work together, and we all have to create synergies and not work against each other. But I think this is, this is working quite well. Tomica, if you have the last word, you're the youngest, but you have the last word in this round. And so how do you uh, see, uh, how, how can you answer the questions? Um, I just want to tackle a little bit uh, the nationalism um, topic that we mentioned uh, in correlation with why we need the European Union, the Western Balkans in general. Uh, the nationalism is a very dangerous weapon that's been used here in the Western Balkans a lot and is still being used. And uh, we forget that the Western Balkans is a multi-ethnic region that can easily be mani manipulated, unfortunately, by the political elites in general. So I will say again, that's why we need that European Union. That's why we have to be part of the union and get that European identity. Because once we get that European identity and be part of, the, of that family, we are safer. We know that the European Union will be there with us fighting corruption, rule of law, and other policies. And as we all agreed at the end, we are going to make Western Balkans a more attractive destination for everyone who wants to come here, not just our diaspora. Because also diaspora can be very tricky, as Mr. Peter said. They can bring a lot of nationalism. But I'm pretty sure and confident once in the European family, we are going to get there, possibly in some period of time, but we are gonna be safer and we are gonna be more developed and a better place to live. Thank you. Well, this was a really wonderful final word and uh, thank you all. Thank you all for, for this very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I would like to say, first of all, uh, I would encourage everyone to, to really do whatever one can in order to contribute, to contribute also to the political uh, life in the, in the region. And of course, the EU is there. The EU sticks to its um, uh, European membership perspective for the entire Western Balkans. But of course, the reforms have to be done in the region. And it takes also the young people of the region to press their governments and, and tell them what to do and what they, what they expect. So thank you once again, and uh, I would encourage everyone to stay tuned for, for the other panels, because uh, now we have, uh, we have looked into, into the, re the reasons why people want to leave the, the Western Balkans, but there will be other panels also, of course, looking at more of the answers. So thank you very much for your attention, and have a good day.